Hello, my name is Annette Delu, and you are listening to The Heart of You. Welcome back. This is episode 43. Today, we have Eileen Head, who is a transformational coach, and she helps couples and singles reconnect to deeply intimate, meaningful relationships. Because I'm sure at times, most of you have felt stuck or trapped or powerless to change the situation that you're in. And Eileen is the person to help you out with that. Eileen is going to speak to us today about Enneagrams. Eileen, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Wonderful. So let's get started. Tell us your spiritual awakening story. Oh, wow. (laughs) I was in, uh, I met my husband at 16 and married at 18 in a very traditional relationship, not knowing much about ourselves or and me in particular. And my husband, I called him my silent partner because he never talked much. He Mm. didn't relate much. We didn't even have a daily conversation of how's your day going? It was sort of, it was like we were business partners. We both selected things in the marriage that we were good at and we did those and we had the same values and morals and goals and all of those things working except the part for me, which was the emotional connection. And so as the years went on, I became very stressed. I became, you know, it started to take my life force energy. If, if, If you know what that is, people, your energy sort of starts to get taken up with stress and worry and anxiety. Yeah, and so absolutely. I came to a point in my life where I was crying all the time. I was crying in the grocery store, uh, big tears, crying, going home. I'd go to walk into the house, and it was like there was a boulder on my shoulder. And this one day, I'm standing in the middle of the bedroom in, in sort of a corner, and this is going to get graphic. I'll warn you. I'll try to make it. <laughs> I'm standing <laughs> there, and it's like the top of my head blew off, and wow. stuff hit the the roof and it's coming down the walls and it's pussy and it's yellowy. And it's like, I looked at that and I thought, girl, you are in very big trouble here. Wow. And I felt something or someone reach out and take my shoulders and they rocked me. And they said in these, just in this cadence, they said, you better start looking after yourself because nobody else will. Wow. And then after that, I had a number of other experiences of sleeping out on the deck in the summertime and and being dead awake. And it was like someone tiptoed up and yelled in my ear, Eileen. And I'd jump awake and I'd look around and there was no one around, no stairs to get there. My husband was sleeping in the house. That happened twice. So those were signs. Wake yeah. up. Wake up. And there's been many others as well. And so, and, and let me talk about the Enneagram because we're talking about that. I was in a meditation and I saw myself in this this room that had no walls or ceiling and I saw these beings sitting off to the side and they were mumbling to themselves and then one came over to me and said, you will bring healing through the Enneagram. And that's why I've been so passionate about it. Wow. So now did you know when you had that first experience when you felt sort of your head getting blown off energetically, like do you know who that was that was that was holding you? Did you really connect with, was it one of your guardian angels? Like, who was it? Uh, probably one of my guides. Yeah. You know, I would think, or, or one of the angels. I mean, I believe they're sort of one and the same. And Right. You know, it, it was a real aha. Uh-huh. And then my son at 14 brought home his future wife, who knew things about the spiritual realm, that my traditional upbringing had no concept whatsoever. And that started putting me in the energy of uh, the spiritual realm. And then I just became fascinated uh, with it. Right. Now, were you scared when you had those particular things happen where you were having those experiences? No, because I was already then starting to delve into Reiki and Okay. I was just open to spiritual experiences. And, and of course, when you open yourself to that sort of energy, people show up, right? 
Yeah. There's lots of people show up that are also connected to that energy. And I started learning from them. And that's how the, the story's unfolding and continues to. Beautiful. Wow. That's a, that's a pretty incredible story. And just hearing everything that you went through, it sounds like your, your clear audience was, was wide open. If you were hearing those voices say to you, Eileen, you know, wake up, you know, it's, yeah. it's incredible to hear when people have their spiritual awakening, how it shows up, you know, whether it shows up, like you said, in, in a voice that comes to you, or if it's a, a vision of some sort, or if it's something that you just feel, it sounds like that was the dominant, but then you, you felt everything, right? Yes. Like that's, yeah, it's incredible. And I started getting some callbacks on mammograms and different things. And, and it was like, uh, this is your wake up call, make a decision here, either be happy where you are or choose to make a, a, a decision. And my yeah. decision was to leave a 35 year marriage, which caused a, a big hoo-ha, let me tell you. Sure. Yeah. Okay. That puts you on the path of Enneagrams. Yes. Can you tell our audience what an Enneagram is? So most of the time people will they'll either go, oh, the Enneagram, I love it, or they go, the Ennea what? And so the Enneagram has been around since the 1700s. It's a very well-respected, much more advanced model than the other personality models that are out there, like Colors or um, Myers-Briggs, which is a total different way of looking at personality. That one is about how your mind thinks to solve problems. Sure. The Enneagram helps you to understand how your personality was formed by about the age of seven in your family of origin. And it's formed by you looking out there and forming a belief that I need to be a certain way and I need to do things in a certain way in order to get the most love and attention. So then you develop these patterns, which then become roles, which then becomes an identity. And that's who you think you are is this personality. And so the Enneagram really is an ancient body of wisdom that holds the key to unlocking the true depth of our being in ourselves and, and recognizing it in other people in a kind and compassionate way. And it shows us that there are nine person at home personality types, each with our own way of thinking, feeling, acting, and reacting. And so most of us are on a journey to discover who am I? We can spend a lifetime of who am I and this makes sense. And I'm reacting this way. And, and then all of a sudden, I'm acting this way. And why is that? And so the Enneagram very, very accurately, when you do find your home type, can help you to understand yourself, your your gifts, which a lot of people are, are totally unaware of. Yeah, you know, their worth, their value in the world, because that's what we're looking for in our relationships is, do you value me? Do you value me? And when you find that for yourself, you have a strong foundation. And then when you take your challenges, because when you read your Enneagram profile, there's going to be things in the, there that are going to sting. Like I read my biography, and, oh, that's so me. And oh my gosh, I didn't know that about me. And oh, that's great. And oh, wow. And then it was like, ooh, I don't like those as well. Those sting a bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's always, it's always hard to see the, the shadow side, yeah. Right. So when you take those challenges and build them into strengths, that's when you create this strong foundation. And from there, you, you, your world absolutely transforms. So would you mind sort of going over the, the nine different personalities, if you will? Sure, I can do that. The Enneagram, I, I didn't give you the background. It's been around since the 1700s. It was brought by the Sufis to the Jesuits, who taught it to the seminarians. And then it started being taken out into North America. And it's used by all different groups of people. Religious people put the the sins on them. The corporate uses it as a very sophisticated model for leadership and, and to bring out the best in their employees. Therapists use it. Counselors use it. It's the fastest way to help people understand each other at a deeper level and connect. Wow. And so the nine different personality types uh, are the perfectors who, as a child, came to believe that in order to be loved, they must be perfect. They, mm -hmm. So everything is, is their perspective is right or wrong. 
doing everything the right way or there's a wrong way and they're very hard on themselves and and they have this inner critic 24/7 that things are never good enough they're never right and consequently that energy comes out in judgments with other people like i'm tr- trying really hard to be perfect here and you're over here having fun how can that be yeah and so to help us understand and have compassion for them as they're on their journey before their awakening. And then there's the two supporter also called as a helper giver. And they feel their worth is in in helping in the world being of service. So they're the ones who you know, you go to a party and you know, the host said, let's leave the dishes till tomorrow. Oh, no, we can't do that. They're in the dish pan, they're cleaning up. Where do you need me to help? They feel their worth is in the helping and do not realize that at the same time, their helping can be intrusive to other people. They yeah. don't understand that their worth is wound up in their giving and find it difficult to receive. Yeah. The achiever, the three achiever, are those that work as their auction, Jen. They love, love, love to succeed. They, you know, they work, work, work. Work is the first priority. They can be on vacation. They're still always working. They got deals going, they got stuff happening. And unfortunately, a lot of time that pushes out the the room for the relationship too until before awakening. Right. The expressor are our dramatic and our emotional people who experience life at a high level of sensitivity to beauty, to sound, to to all things beautiful, and they teach us the beauty of the world. But they also can have highs and lows and, and, and dramas because they're highly emotional before they learn how to manage those those emotions and the impact those emotions may ha- have on other people who maybe don't know how to respond. Yeah. The contemplators are our thinkers. They are our intellectuals. They are our teachers and, and the people who develop IT and work in the IT industry. They can figure out things. They are the thinkers and the you know, as I said, the intellectuals and the introverts. The sixth questioner is is the most nervous and the, the, you know, they're looking out into the world to see what can happen. And they always want to be prepared because they, they need this security and, and they're looking for trust in the world. And, and they also have the funniest wit ever and are the most loyal of people. Then there's the seven optimisters, which all of us want parts of ourselves of this who are always having fun. You know, work needs to be fun. They're lighthearted. They gather people around them. People are attracted to them. They're very fun. And when they're undeveloped, they, you know, they may not show up when they agree to something. They're out having fun or they get sidetracked <laughs> with something else. Even right. work needs to be fun. And then there's the asserters. These are the strong people who are usually the, the owners and business people and the managers who like a sense of control over life and you know they like to run things and they also most of the time people see them as very unemotional they don't like to be vulnerable they see that as weak and what we don't know about them is they have a very soft heart underneath that all that overprotection and then we have the peace seekers or the peacemakers who just want everything peaceful let's just all get along let's all you know just be kind to each other and have difficulty in communicating and use passive aggressive behavior as a way of of keeping themselves safe. So, I mean, there's so much more to this and we have all of these parts in us. It is a matter of identifying when we use them, why we use them and how to bring out the best in ourselves and relating to other people. As you were going through each one of the nine personalities, of course, in my head, I'm I'm sitting here thinking, oh yeah, that's that's totally my mom or that's totally my friend or you know that kind of thing. You can kind of go to that place of almost identifying somebody with a particular personality when it's your experience that you've had with them, but I mean, how often is it correct that let's say if I have a relationship with somebody and I'm like, yeah, they're definitely that particular personality? How often is that correct if you sort of place that on somebody else? Not always. I've been doing this a lot of time. And my own sister-in-law, I thought she was a supporter. And then all of a sudden, one day I went, oh, no, she's a peace seeker. 
And, you know, you don't want to put that on other people. What this is meant to do is to open your perspective of, oh, they might be reacting because their worth is this way or they feel that their value is this way or they're comfortable in these patterns, even if these patterns don't work for them you know, these behaviors, it it can help you be more compassionate of, okay, so now I can relate to this person because they're passive aggressive, or they need to be a perfectionist, and, and everything needs to be right or wrong with them. And, and so you can, you can take those instances with more compassion. And if you can put yourself out of the way, and not personalize their reactions, you can relate to people at a deeper level. And, and, with a sense of, you know, you, you access your heart more, your compassion more of, of understanding people and you get rid of the judgment and the, the box thinking of things. The world has to be as you see it, your yeah. perspective only. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I kind of brought that up because it is sort of a, almost a natural thing for us to do when you are looking at these different personality types is to say, oh yeah, that's totally me or that's totally somebody else I know. And to sort of withdraw that, almost pushing that particular personality type onto somebody else without actually them being involved in taking the test or whatever it happens to be. To to do that is actually doing a disservice, I think, because you wouldn't want to place that on somebody else and you wouldn't want somebody placing that on you. Exactly. Yes. Because I've been doing this a long time, I recognize patterns, right? Yeah. And so when I meet people, I don't necessarily categorize them. I just watch the patterns and I go, okay, okay. Yeah. I can, I can relate to you this way or, you know, so, you know, it's, it's broke up into three different segments. There are the emotional types, which are the supporters, achievers, and expressors. There's the thinker types, which are the contemplators, the questioners, and the optimisters. And then there's the the gut or body types, which are the asserter, peace seeker, and perfecter. So even if you identify three segments, that helps you as well. Oh, that person's emotional, that an emotional base sounds like they're an emotional based person. Okay, I can relate to them that way, or they're in their head more, which for me, being an emotional person, that was a real growth thing, was to get out of my emotional side and relate to people intellectually. (laughs) Right. It it really uh, helps you stretch and grow. I'll tell you, it makes the world so much more richer. I can imagine. Yeah. You had me take the test actually before we decided to record this episode. And you asked me to choose one that would be sort of my main personality. And then you asked me to choose two that would be what you would, you said it was considered the wing, right? Right. When I was taking the test, I went, you know, I read through each one of the personalities and I found it difficult to choose simply because there were certain personalities that I could look at and I could say, oh yeah, that was, that was totally me maybe 10 years ago, but maybe not so much now because, you know, I've done this kind of shadow work, or I've done this work on myself in in the Akashic records or whatever it happens to be. So, you know, I finally did land on a particular personality type. And a lot of that was actually due to the, to the images. So you also, not only do you have descriptions, but then you have images that people can look at and sort of identify with. And it's no surprise because I'm definitely more of a visual person anyway, that when I looked at the images, that's what sort of solidified that particular personality type for me. Mm -hmm. The ones that I chose. So I said that I was an expressor. So that was the first one. And the second one I chose was the peace seeker. And then the third was the contemplator. (laughs) That's fine. (laughs) Yes. And, and I can tell you, um, why some of those are relevant and some are not. And I want to again stipulate we have all nine types in us. We have, at any given time, we can access little pieces here and there. And that's why I tell people when they take the test, the paragraph overall, not individual pieces in the paragraph. Right. And so as a four expressor, let me just look at this. So when you look at the Enneagram symbol, it's very confusing because there's arrows going everywhere. (laughs) <laughs> but it doesn't take long for people, and it probably only takes one session for me to explain 
their Enneagram and which arrows and which personality types they're connected to and why that is. And so for you, I think you also said the supporter. And the supporter is when you are in a stress pattern. These are the, the, the patterns that or the traits or the uh, behaviors that you tend to go to. And when you're in a stress pattern, it's like you become someone different for a short period of time. And you often say, well, that does, that's not like I usually am. And so these are places where you go and then you come back to your home type. Your five contemplator is a wing. It's a personality on beside you that flavors your personality, gives you a bit more depth to your personality. Mm. You also chose a nine personality. Uh, twos and nines are lookalikes. So I would say mm, not so much the peacemaker because supporters are, are um, they're all about relationships. So that's how you would relate to that. Your okay. company development is actually a perfecter. And you might relate to this in your growth in when you become emotional, when you those emotions are really strong, you may have, have, have had the growth to ground yourself more to maybe you start making lists, maybe you start looking at more structure, which is, you know, in the beginning of your personality, fours don't like structures. <laughs> right. Do you relate to that? So I'm curious because the ones that I chose were not necessarily the ones that you were giving me. So how how do you come to that that sort of conclusion? Because that is, I mean, I would say that is accurate from the standpoint of, you know, when I am under stress, I can have a tendency to react differently than I normally would. I would say that is definitely true. And also in terms of when I get overwhelmed, if there's too much for me to do, then I do have to go into structure because mm -hmm. otherwise it'll just start stressing me out completely. And spiraling, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's, that is, I would say that is accurate, but I am curious as to how you came to that, given the fact that I didn't even really choose either one of those two. Well, that is the Enneagram basis. Once you choose your home type, then these are the things that come into play. Now, the Enneagram okay. teaches, I mean, it, it can be a lifetime study of finding which home type you are. And, uh, you know, it can, some people take that journey of, and they bump around, around, some people read it and go, yep, that's me, I got that. And others, well, I'm a little of this, well, I'm a little of that. Especially sure. the peacemakers, because they identify with all nine types. But that's why I feel, for me, I like to help people find it faster and then give them the relevant information afterwards. And that's okay. why I recommend hopping on a call after you've taken the test and let's figure this out. And then I have profiles that I can give you, which are way more information than you may ever want. But it really <laughs> gives you the Enneagram is about growth. It is about spiritual growth. It is about wanting to become the best person you can be. And that self empowerment, that self love, that self-acceptance of all the parts of yourself, bringing them together. So even now I can be triggered in some things. I meant the theme in my personality is rejection. Mm. You may relate to that in our, our uh, Akashic Records <laughs> session. Yeah, yeah. And so I find it interesting when I'm doing personality is that those things in past lives often line up. And, and so I can be triggered, but now I can see it and I can go, ah, there you are again. And now I'm going to accept it, work through it, look at it, and grow from it instead of being wounded by it when I'm rejected right. or people put me off. And understand why they may be doing that and have no idea. It's my reaction to it. That's, that's the wounds and that's the healing from the childhood that needs to come about. Yeah, and it's, it's such a, it's a beautiful journey to take when you are working through any of those shadow sides. And, you know, we've talked about shadow work on this podcast. And however you do shadow work is entirely up to you. And there are so many different modalities. And it sounds like this is a really great modality to use to, to dive into your shadow too, because if the, if you have parts of you that you're sort of ignoring, which, you know, it's a, it's a constant process of exploration. Like there are things that I didn't realize were still in my shadow and all of a sudden they pop up and I was like, huh, okay. That's interesting. I didn't know that that was still there. And mm -hmm. the difference is being able to now have the tools to actually 
stop and not, as you said, operate from your wounding and actually not react and say, okay, so where is this coming from? And what is this all about? Or feeling those emotions, right? Yeah. As they come up, that's how you heal them, right? Yeah. It's in that. And, you know, for me, it gave me compassion. You know, I did my own inner child work and, and looking, taking myself back at around that age of seven and looking at my life and, and really coming to understand how I came about to be this way in the world and with compassion and understanding and seeing myself as that little girl who was, you know, in this family and we all had our own dynamics. I often refer to it as like uh, planets and we're all, you know, around each other and, and we're connected, but you know, we, we may not be that connected and all of right. those things and to feel the emotions deeply of the not being as connected as I wanted them to be. That's a theme in my life. So am I over connect, trying to overconnect to people? Uh, how do I manage that? Right? Right, right. Once you actually get your main personality type, is that a constant throughout your whole life or can that change as you do this work? You can only have one ego. <laughs> and so you are always that home type, but there are nine levels of development. So there's from the very lower undeveloped to the higher realms of the patterns that are within your home personality. So as my two supporter, I now, you know, instead of, uh, oh, you need to do this. Here's my advice. I know all this. I can help you. I can say to people, I have some insights. Are you open to hearing them or would you rather not? And then oh, letting go yeah. of the outcome when they say maybe, mm, no, not so much. I don't need it. Okay. Right. That's all I need to do. Right. Instead of feeling that as rejection, I now see that as growth and empowerment that I can let that go now. Okay. They're not ready, whatever. And I can move past and work through every layer of that that comes up that, oh, here you are again, you little devil. <laughs> and I can make a game of it like, okay, what do you want this time? All right. What do you want me to do? All right. Okay. Okay. You know, right. <laughs> and we, you know, we know in the spiritual realm that life lessons come up and they come up a little bit and then they come up a little bit stronger and then a little stronger until they're flashing lights. And, yeah. you know, life, life uh, crises happen when we don't pay attention. Yeah, absolutely. That is so true. And that's when relationships fall apart. That's when you lose jobs. That's when, you know, all of those things start happening is, is basically the universe's way of saying, Hey, you need to look at this. Yeah. In order for somebody to, let's say, not have relationships fall apart, what are this, what are some of the ways in which Enneagrams can help somebody with a, an interpersonal relationship? Yeah. So this is a personal journey as well as it's a relationship journey. And so what I do, um, you know, I had a couple come to me and they both said, you know, we've tried everything. We've been to therapy. If this doesn't work, we're done. We're tired okay. of struggling. We're done. And so what I do is I interpret their personalities together. I, I help them to understand, you know, why is your partner getting twisted out of shape about you leaving the cupboard doors open? Like the cupboard, what's the big deal? But to them, it's a crisis, right? Yeah. How they talk to each other, what's important, why it's important. And the, the main thing that the Enneagram does is it, it helps you to understand emotionally how you feel loved and how they feel loved, which is most often different. And yeah. so they came to me and I worked with first one and then the other, and then I bring them together and we work out situations. And they came a couple of times. And the last time they came together, you know, I have them sit opposite each other and look in each other's eyes and talk to each other. And, you know, I listen to the wording they're using and I ask them to reframe the way they're talking and different things they're doing. And by the time they left, they were holding hands and there was a sparkle in their eye again. And that just warms oh, my beautiful. heart. That, that's wow. what makes it worthwhile for me. I want to help people here. Well, here's the helper, right? So they, don't, <laughs> right? <laughs> so they don't struggle. I struggled for 35 years with a good man. Yeah. And I, it makes you wonder sometimes if that experience that you had as a young adult and, and being married for 35 years, having that experience was 
sort of meant to happen in order for you to get to where you are now in order to be able to help people, right? Unquestionably. So, yeah, <laughs> and it's it's one of those things where while you're going through the challenges, you're like, why? <laughs> and then, you know, the universe is like, oh, yeah, this is why. And you're like, well, here's oh. the cool thing. As <laughs> as I'm, you know, I'm, as I said, okay, I'm leaving. I mean, we'd said that many, many times. But okay, now I definitely am leaving. And he knew I was serious. Now, all of a sudden, which sometimes happens, okay, let's do something. Let's find a relationship course. And I want to bang my head against the wall, like 35 years of trying to get this man to do this. Yeah. And all I could find was an Enneagram course. Right. And we started taking that. And my world, like, oh, like the angels saying, oh, my God, when I looked at the two of our personalities together, I could see how we weren't relating, how we could have related, understood each other, my part, his role instead of blaming him. But I was already too far gone. Right. This can be the love of your life, but love dies. And it was too late. But that brought me to the Enneagram, to your point. That yeah. brought me to my life work. Yeah. So that, that brings me to a question in regards to working with another person on the, the, the challenges that you have. What, what do you recommend to somebody if, let's say, their partner is not in that space and doesn't necessarily want to take an Enneagram test or doesn't want to do any of this work? What would you recommend? In my stay or go coaching, I often have mostly women, of course, in their mid 50s, I find women get to a point where is this all there is? And they have this low grade dissatisfaction, resentment, and they come to me and they say, okay, I'm ready to go help me move through this. And so my first three things, we're going to re-energize, reconnect, we're going to look at everything, but this is going to be about you. And we're going to work on you. And as you shift, everything around you can shift. Yeah. And we, you know, their partner, I've had a number their partner has not been involved in the beginning until I teach them how to talk to their partner. And they can say to them, you know, I'm working on me and this is what I've come to discover about me. And I had no idea that that might affect you. Have you noticed that? And they go, what's this? I've been blamed my whole life for the one who's screwing up. And now, wow, this is a different dynamic. And they'll say, you know, I'm learning about my personality and these traits. And I wanted to know about yours. Do you, and so we start to figure out which personality types they might be from the patterns. And then okay. they can go and say, tell me if this is true for you, because I want to understand you better too. And then all of a sudden I get phone calls. Well, I want in on this. I want my own session. And, and <laughs> you know, I've, I've seen relationships come back together, like just, uh, and not everyone, of course, but this is a personal journey. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's something that, I have had experience with in another way. I've spoken about this in another episode in regards to my relationship with my father. And while I was doing all this energetic work, just the way that I, I was showing up in our relationship changed and shifted the way things were between us. So what you're describing is very much exactly that. It just changes and shifts. And so then if that person is now more engaged and now is more interested in, in all of these changes that you're making, then mm -hmm. that in turn sort of intrigues them into wanting to do the work as well. Is that basically what you're saying? Yeah. You're taking responsibility for yourself because we know we have our own stories. We create these stories and we make them up and we judgments on the other people, but in the spiritual work that you and I do, it is about taking response ability, the ability yeah. to change your response. And when you start working on you and taking accountability, and one of the deadly sins in relationships is justifying your behavior. <laughs> when oh, it's yeah, bad behavior. And, 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 you know, so I work with people, and I even work with career people, you know, problems at work and siblings and all sorts of different instances. But when you start working on you and take responsibility alone for how you're responding, that shifts everything. When you're working on you, obviously that is something that makes profound shifts and changes. When you are working on you for you, that happens. If you are working on you to get a result out of somebody else, 
personally, mm. I have found that that is not as effective because your, your, your sort of energy is focused on the wrong thing. You're focusing on somebody else versus on yourself. Would that be the same case here as well? Yeah, because you're looking to fix the other person. Yeah, exactly. You're still looking, your perspective is, I'm looking to find out what's wrong with you. Right. Instead of looking to find out how, what, it, you know, that was the biggest healing for me was that how, what was my part in that? What yeah. was, you know, how was I affecting him? And and when I began to see that, that sort of uh, healed things for me. And I had more compassion with him. And I was able to bring about that divorce very peacefully for my children. We continued to have suppers together monthly, at least there was no dramas with my kids or after the first maybe month or so that things level, but I could lead everyone else through it because I didn't have my own drama. I was just, I knew, um, you know, I knew their personality types and then I, I knew how to manage myself basically. Yeah. Yeah. Now, have you come across any personality types where it's just incredibly difficult for somebody with, let's say, you know, this particular personality type to get along with another personality type? Have you ever found that sort of almost friction between two main personality types? Absolutely. That's what causes the friction in people. It's okay. the, the perspective. You know, I'm, I mentioned the perfecter who you know, they're at work putting in long hours. They're, you know, it's, it's getting it right. I'm not going to give that until every I is crossed and T and I'm going to go over it and over it and over here. The optimist at four o'clock is having uh, chair races up and down the aisle. Like it's time to go. Let's go, to, <laughs> let's go have fun. Like, man, that's not right. And why can they do that? And, and of course, you know, the, the, the supporter that I am that wants to connect with people deeply finds it difficult with some contemplators because there's such head types and they're so logic. They don't want to go in the emotional realm. So yeah, but that's what makes it interesting too. So then after somebody has a session with you or several sessions with you and they have a deeper understanding of their personality type and the relationships that they, they have as well, then does that friction start to subside and then it becomes easier to to manage and, and sort of navigate through all of the personality types? A lot of the time, but you know, there's there's things like siblings and childhood issues and and a lot of people cannot negotiate those on them on by themselves or sure. on their own. Sometimes those you know as well as I do that in this lifetime, those may not be resolved. No matter how yeah. much growth you personally have, if the other person isn't willing or there it may not get resolved. And that's, that's part of understanding yourself, knowing you did the best and letting go of outcome, which is one of the biggest things that I teach, besides law of attraction and manifesting and all that is letting go of outcome that frees you from so much. And that's the hardest thing, right? I mean, letting go of outcome is probably one of the hardest things that and I would say living in uncertainty, which is, I think those are two of the hardest things that we as humans uh, deal with on an emotional level. Yeah. And there's a whole personality type that lives in that realm. The questioner is fear, worry, and anxiety is the basis of their personality. And for them, they, they feel they're, they're deficient. There's something wrong with them. And yet they, they, there's millions of people who think, act and react the way they do. And their gift is making our world safer because they're always looking out there to make systems and whatnot safer and they have a plan A, a plan B, a plan C. Right. <laughs> right. The rest of us are just kind of winging it, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. You were talking about siblings or let's say family members and, you know, potentially having things not be resolved in this lifetime. The other thing I wanted to mention too was that, you know, sometimes it's not in our soul contract to resolve it. So yeah. maybe we actually came to this incarnation with a particular goal and it's possible the other person didn't fulfill their end of the bargain, or it's possible that you already fulfilled it, but it's not your job to wake them up or it's not your job to make them better in any way. Maybe you had a different potential mission for this particular lifetime. So, you know, I think people sometimes want to fix everything 
you know, before there is an end of the journey, you know, before people cross over. And I certainly had that with my father where I was, I was like, well, asking my, my guides like, oh, well, do I need to get him to do an Akashic record session so he can clear some stuff before he crosses over? And they're like, nope, he's good. He needs to do all of what he needs to do. And you don't need to interfere with that. And I'm like, okay, cool. Right. So, I mean, there are certain things that they don't necessarily need to be resolved. Absolutely. I I 100% agree in that. You know, my personality before this was a super pleaser. You know, I felt like I was was clothes on a clothesline. My hand were attached, but my feet were flapping in the wind and I was somebody for everybody. Now, when I need to stand up and, and maybe give people the hard facts, like I do in coaching sometimes, bring people to awareness or whatever, before I would have cringed from that. And now, like you say, I believe it's in my soul contract to bring them to awareness, maybe plant seeds, maybe they're not ready for it, and they go away upset. However, I feel I've fulfilled my role. Yeah. Well, and actually, even if somebody goes away upset, that is almost an indicator that it's seeping in like the seed has been planted, (laughs) right? Nothing hurts like the truth, darn it. (laughs) Right, exactly. (laughs) You know, because you were saying like when you point out that shadow portion of you and you're not ready to take a look at that, that's definitely going to be something that's going to trigger you into some sort of negative emotion, but it's it's not going to just go away. You're it's going to be there because somebody just basically showed it to you. Right. That's that's the beginning stage of of healing that part. Yeah. And, you know, as we do our spiritual growth and our spiritual journey, we get lighter, we get more fun. Uh, Yes. You know, people, people say to me all the time, you have such great energy. And I I think, thank you. Uh, You should have seen me (laughs) a lot of years ago (laughs) when I, you know, when I carried this huge weight of the world around on my shoulders and life was boring and, and I was always stressed. I had bleeding ulcers and all sorts of things. And now I, I lead a very free and happy flowing life. And, and people say, you have such a great life. You're so lucky. And I go, no luck involved. I created yeah. my life consciously, create it and decide how my life is going to go. Yeah. How do these personality types fit into your intuition? So how do those marry together? Because I know, I mean, you're definitely a coach that that sort of melds all of those different modalities. So how do those how do those go together? Well, when I know their personality type, I know all their patterns, right? And right. then as I'm coaching them, I hear, you know, I, I it just comes to me what to say, what they need to hear. Um, it, it, you know, the messages just come. And yeah. I can I can take it deeper from a model of a personality type into a person. And this is just a tool. It isn't, right. you know, it, it, I do use all these other things that I've learned about energy and and manifesting and letting go and law of attraction and abundance, all of those things. And man, I've been manifesting lots of really cool things. Yes. Fantastic. Yes, you have. And so that actually is a really great segue because I wanted to ask you what somebody could expect from a session with you. Yeah, I have a shift program. It's called a shift to transform your life, love and relationships. I think it's what it's called. And in that, I take you through a number of these steps. We do look at your childhood. We do look at your personality. We look at, you know, what it is you want, your thinking process, how to let go of some of those stories that that trap us in non-reality. You know, how many times have you had, I had this experience recently with my son, and I got into this story and I was upset and we met and we stood toe to toe and it was like, no, 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 no. And finally he just said to me, mom, if you're hurt, why don't you just tell me that? Uh... The whole story when we got into it, even with intuition was wrong. It wow. was totally off base. And so, you know, we lead our own journey, even though we're intuitives, but I use my intuition to look above overall, right? Yeah. You know, even though we are practitioners and we help people in this way with intuition and, you know, you with, you know, the people's patterns and relationships and me and the Hashik records that it's infinitely easier to do this work for other people than it is to do for yourself. Yeah. Because 
you, like you said, you know, you're in that situation with your son, you're in that heightened state of wounding. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to access your intuition at that moment. Yeah. And so like in order for me, I know personally, I have to, I really have to take the time. I have to take a time out and be like, okay, I need to go to my corner and I need to go meditate and actually get into the, to the right space in order to at least come to a place where I'm reacting from, you know, my, my heart space, as opposed to my ego and my brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and we must remember our ego is, has a vested interest in keeping us where we are. (laughs) Oh yeah, absolutely. We, we need to understand that's a whole different mechanism there that we, uh, need to overcome. But, you know, <laughs> for me, I, I am so much more adventurous and I'm joyful and it's about thriving in your life. And, and are you in the box? Uh, are you willing to get out of the box? We form these patterns of everything in our life, how we eat, how we drive to the store, how we react to people. And that's what makes it the same, same boring. And I'm just putting out a newsletter, actually, where I tell people this one experience where I decided I went to the grocery store and I thought, what would it be like if I started at the other end? Instead of at the produce, I'll, I'll start at the other end. And so I started there, but it ends up that I'm instead of going down the aisles, I was coming up the aisles. It was so disorienting. And, and I was seeing things that I hadn't seen before in a different way. And like it was like, it was almost stressful, but it was kind of cool in showing me that my mind's very fixed, right? We go in unconscious because we believe it saves us time and it's easier, and, but then it's boring. So I have an interesting thing. I asked my guides because I go at life 99 miles an hour. And so I asked my guides that if there's something important that I need to take notice of, make my left ear ring. And so I can be going along and all of a sudden my ear will start to ring. And I've trained myself now often enough that I'll stop and I'll go, okay, what is it? What is it that I'm supposed to see, hear, do, whatever? And it pauses me. And we all can do that, right? You know, I've I've had that experience before and I didn't, and it was actually earlier on my spiritual awakening. I don't get it so much anymore, but, you know, earlier what I would get is in my left ear, I would get a high pitch tone. Mm-hmm. And then in my right ear, I would get like a lower pitch tone mm-hmm. and it was, it was very obvious. It was something like my, my guides were tapping me on the shoulder, trying to tell me something at the time. I couldn't figure out what it is they were trying to tell me because I didn't, I didn't have the right tools. I didn't, I didn't know enough at the time to, to really investigate and to understand what it was that they were trying to tell me. But I think it was, it was one of those situations where they were using every single means possible in order to get my attention. So so yeah, I really love that. That's a that's a good way to to bring that back in and say, hey, if you want to give me a sign, that's a good way to do it. Yeah, and if you're at the beginning of your spiritual growth, these are things you can do so that you start to train and form patterns of listening or stopping or becoming more aware or getting in touch with your guides and and you know the realms that are available to us. Only we don't know that, and we need to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Now I know that this work that you do, it is cumulative. So I know that you can't just necessarily expect to have one session and have all of your shadow work done and that sort of thing. What is that sort of sweet spot? What do you find with your clients? Like how many sessions do you usually recommend? I ask them for a commitment of six sessions to begin with. Okay, great. In those six sessions, I'm going to start laying a foundation bring them to awareness of themselves. We're going to start looking at some of the things that are, you know, the wounds or the things that's happening in life, and then give them a perspective of why they're happening, maybe how they can shift things and the energy. And a lot of people aren't aware of energy, right? Right. Their own energy of, of, you know, are they putting out negative energy or positive energy and all those sorts of things and helping them to get to a higher vibration. And so at least six sessions is what I ask for. You know, I just intuitively, I don't generally set them up. We're going to start with this and we'll see where we go. And intuition takes over and away we go. And we work on whatever comes up. Oh, that sounds great. Okay. So if somebody wants to book a set of six sessions with you because they are at this moment saying yes, yes, yes to all of this, how do they get a hold of you? On my website, eileenhead.com, there is a free call. 
I ask you to hop on that call and we'll chat about where you're at and what you're looking for. And then we will, I'll tell you how the coaching package works and we will move forward. I also do individually, I do a couple readings of personalities and I also do individual readings. And, you know, I wanted to add that this is for single people. This is so important for singles who are out there in this, in that realm because dating online and especially as we mature gets to be more difficult because some of us are set in our ways and this is a wonderful tool to know what you're bringing to relationships what your worth is because your worth can really take a hit yes no uh, I don't like you okay now I'm moving on like it's like (laughs) right well and also not only that but It's something that is difficult from, it's difficult from the standpoint of if you are on your spiritual journey, when you are in that process of clearing and raising your vibration and doing all of that, it becomes difficult to energetically match with somebody to begin with and then add all of the other, you know, wounding or all the other patterns and the the things that you might be stuck in. It makes it that much more difficult, right? Right. Yes, it can. But, you know, I'm always working on changing my perspective. And so, you know, I would take difficult and I would say more interesting. And, you know, like, oh, isn't that interesting? (laughs) Because I'm not personalizing as much stuff. Now, I understand that person got scared or they got triggered or they didn't want to change their ways or they didn't feel they could fit in with me more often is the case. Because I've done a lot of this work. It's like, you know, I'm not going to be with someone who, if you're open to growing, that's a possibility for me. But if you're really set and saying, nope, take me as I am, and we're not an energetic match, then I'm happy to continue single until I find that person that's an energetic match. 100%. And I've, I've said this to a lot of my clients as well, where, you know, they, they're curious as to why maybe they've been single for a few years, and they've, they're on the spiritual journey. and, And it's, a lot of times what happens is the universe is like, well, you're rapidly growing so much and your energy is changing so much. If you start dating somebody now, they may be an energetic match now, but then in six months, if they're not growing at the same pace that you are or relatively the same pace, you're going to sort of outgrow them energetically and it's going to be done. Right. So, but it depends on if that person was necessary for your experience or for your learning and and figuring out your triggers and things like that. So It's all a really beautiful dance that happens on whether or not you need somebody to come into your experience to help you move forward or not. And every person is meant to, or it would not be happening. So, you know, the guy who says, no, you're not for me, I'm moving on. It's like, oh, okay, thank you. I learned that. (laughs) (laughs) I'll take the knife out of my heart and I'll do a little bit of healing, but I did learn a lot. So thank you for that. Well, it helps to, it helps to depersonalize it a lot as well, because I mean, I was just on, I was, you know, I'm on the apps and stuff. And so I had been talking to this guy and it literally, we had only exchanged maybe three or four text messages. And he basically was like, oh, I hope you can deal with the fact that I'm a sex addict. And I'm (laughs) like, thanks for being honest. This is really great. I said, well, energetically, Um, I'm not cool with my partner actually having sex with other people. So yeah, good luck, (laughs) you know? So I didn't take it personally in any way. I wasn't like, oh my God, what a, you know, horrible person. No judgment. I was like, good luck. And I hope you find that perfect woman that is exactly in the same place that you are, you Mm -hmm. know? So to be able to have that, that energy to, to move forward, it really, it helps to not be wounded by literally every last little thing that happens when you are out there dating. Yeah. And for me, it's, it's a, everything's an adventure. Like, Oh, I learned that. Oh, I learned that. I just yeah. love learning now. And, and so, yeah, instead of personalizing it, it's more often than not, it's, it's me saying, sorry, I don't feel we're a match. And, uh, but as you told me in my session and, and I've learned be, before as well, each of us are meant to be even if it's for an hour, we are meant to have that exchange. Season the yeah. reason in our lifetime, right? Yeah, 100%. That is really beautiful. That's a good place to close this episode, I think. I want to thank you again for joining me today. I want to tell everyone, again, you can reach Eileen at EileenHead.com. So E-I-L 
E-E-N-H-E-A-D.com. Right. It's been lovely speaking to you. It's been so much fun. And, you know, I'd love to come on again with some other things. So I will look forward to hearing from anyone who's interested in learning more. Absolutely. I would love to talk to you about all of the other wonderful things that you do as well. And that's the funny thing is, is that I, you know, I create these episodes, you know, sort of honing in on one topic because it helps people to, you know, understand what each of the tools that we use are. But as you become a practitioner in this, in this multidimensional experience, you use so many different tools and you have so many different things that you work with. And, you know, so it's not just Eileen Head who is working with the Enneagram. You are working with your channel, you're working with your intuition, you're working with everything that you have in your spiritual gifts and your little spiritual toolbox. So yeah, we'll definitely chat again. Nice. Thank you. And, and, you know, what I would say to all of you is find a way to thrive because that's the way life's meant to be. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. If you would like to get in touch with me, you can reach me at infinitesoullove.com. You can also reach me on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, as well as Facebook at infinitesoullove1111. 